Good morning, Antioch. Good morning. Welcome, welcome this morning. It is good to be in the house of the Lord, amen? Yeah. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 96, 1 and 2. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. And we are going to proclaim his salvation this morning. So I'd like to invite you this morning to stand if you're willing and able and uh, sing some songs with us. Stay. 
Dear Heavenly Father, have mercy on us. Lord, we just thank you for another day to praise you, to worship you, to sing your praises, Father. Lord, we thank you for the rain to nourish our lands. Lord, we thank you for our friends and our family, Father. Lord, we thank you for our health. Lord, help us to not forget how, how powerful you are, how in control of this world you are, Father. Sometimes we, we lose track of how great and awesome and mighty and powerful you are. Dear Heavenly Father, we just invite your Holy Spirit to be part of this service with us today, Lord. We pray that our songs and our, our um, scriptures and, and the word that we're going to hear from JT, we pray that all that is to your glory, Father. We just thank you for all that you give us, and in your name we pray, and all of God's people would say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, Book of Leviticus, chapter number 25, 35, reminds us, if one of your countrymen becomes poor and is unable to support himself among you, help him as you would an alien or a temporary resident so that he can continue to live among you. And uh, this is uh, part of God's word, part of God's law that goes back um, over 2,000 years, and we're grateful, and uh, more like 3,000, we're grateful for His provision for us, and as He provides for us, we're to extend that provision and provide for others as well. And I uh, just heard from uh, one, one of you this morning that uh, has a ministry of providing meals to someone uh, who may be in need uh, for whatever the reason, and so thank you for loving and caring for each other. I invite you to stand and sing the doxology as we celebrate what God God is doing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father. be seated this morning. And let me uh, invite Sister Becky Reynolds to come up. Um, we are looking forward to the Vacation Bible School. We had to cancel all that last year, but uh, not this year, God willing. Amen? And so uh, appreciate Sister Becky. She, uh, bless her heart, she teaches all day long and all year long. And then she's volunteered to head up our VBS effort as well. And so uh, we appreciate all that she is doing for Jesus and for us. Sister Becky, I invite you to come. Okay. Oh, it is. <laughs> um, like Pastor George said, my name is Becky Reynolds, and um, my family and I normally attend the second service. Um, but I'm here today to talk about um, Vacation Bible School that we have planned for June 27th through the 30th. Um, and I'm really excited that we get to, to do Bible school this year. And hopefully this clicker's going to work. Okay. <laughs> Um, after, uh, oh, it's starting. Wait, if I go back, I gotta get used to this. Is it paused? Okay. It's paused. Okay, so after a year away, um, we're gonna be having vacation Bible school today, and I thought, you know, I'm excited that we get to do it, and so to kind of get you all excited too, I thought I would play the theme song to our Rocky Railway um, program that we're gonna be doing. Hopefully. We trust, we trust, we trust in you, Jesus, you're all, you're all, you're all that we need. Your power 
this journey there's no looking back with jesus to lead us we're on the right track oh, 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 oh. wide open spaces for wide open eyes we're looking ahead for the next big surprise oh, oh, oh. to lead us where I'm I don't know about you all. I just I love the music with this program. Um, so it takes a lot of volunteers to put together a, a Bible school, um, and I just was hoping that you know if I talk today, maybe I might be able to drum up some support um, to help us with that. Um, the ultimate goal is to be able to you know to if we just get one child who's never heard of Jesus's love before to be able for them to hear that for the first time. I think that would totally be worth it. Um, there are many ways that you can help with Bible school. Um, first and foremost is decorating, um, helping to tr transform Antioch into a Rocky Railway station. Normally we try to have the front of the sanctuary decorated and then we also try to have decorations out in the fellowship hall and also down in the classroom where the lesson is taught. Um, we also need leaders for each group. Um, for ages pre-K through fourth grade that take the kids to the different stations. You don't have to do anything. It's pretty much just crowd control and making sure they get where they need to go for each station. Um, teachers for each night to provide the nightly lesson. So you just stay in the room where the lesson is taught and you just teach the lesson to the different groups. Um, you might have to adjust um, the lesson you know, for the different ages, but that lesson is provided for you. Um, and so there's no work for you. You just have to be prepared to come and teach it, but it's already been created for you. Um, kitchen help. Um, we do a snack. That's one of the rotations. Um, and if someone is interested in taking that on and wants to create snacks, like come up with snack ideas, that's fine, or else we have already created snacks that you just have to make sure that they're put together and given to the kids. Um, so we, you just heard the song. Um, the kids learned a couple songs during the week. We already have the fabulous Debbie Cummins who has agreed to lead the music, but she could also use some help in here, just helping to corral the kids and helping to, them to learn any emotions that go along with it. Um, so she could definitely use some help there. Um, games or recreation is also another station that the kids go to. Those games are already created. You just have to, and the supplies will be given to you. You just have to teach the kids the game and just crowd control. I guess that's the biggest thing. Just make sure you don't lose anybody. Um, 
Then we also, one of the, la the last rotation is crafts. Um, we try to have a craft. Um, once again, if there's a, someone that's, if this interests you and you want to come up with the crafts yourself, that's fine, or else we can do what is provided with the program. Um, so if someone would be interested in leading that or just be a helper in the room um, to help put together the craft, that would be great too. Um, because of COVID, you know, because of COVID last year and not having Bible school, I'm in, you know, we're anticipating a large number of kids wanting to get out and come to Bible school again. Um, so please consider helping. Um, if you can't help, we'll definitely take your prayers. <laughs> Um, and if you are interested in helping, I am going to be set up um, outside in the fellowship hall after church today, um, and I would love to have you sign up to help. Um, if you think about it later and want to sign up, um, there's going to be a information in the newsletter coming out that has my name, my number, and my email, or else I might see if they can go ahead and include this like in the bulletin next week too, um, but that's um, one way you can get a hold of me as well. So, thank you. Becky, thank you for leading that and uh, heading that up. Please uh, let Becky know how you can help her and, uh, and help Jesus by sharing him with these young folks. Um, we, uh, I don't think we've ever lost any. We had one that disappeared for a couple months, but we found them later. So, um, no, we're uh, thankful for everybody that has helped and uh, looking forward to a good time in Jesus again. We want to continue our worship this morning as we seek the Lord in prayer. I invite you to bow your heads with me this morning. Father God, what an awesome, beautiful morning after the, after the shower last night. God, I thank you so much for everywhere we look right now. It's, it's just really incredible, and we give you praise. We give you glory. We give you thanks. Father, the, the springtime is, is just so remarkable, and we're just grateful, Lord, for your creative hand that we see displayed in so many different ways. Father, we're thankful for the many material blessings that you give to us, God. We're, we, we recognize this morning uh, places that we have to live and shelter over our heads and food to eat and clothes to wear. And Father, I, I thank you for transportation and, and all of those things. But Father, we're also thankful for the social blessings of our families and our friends, Lord, that we have around us. Father, we're grateful especially for the spiritual blessings that we have. Lord, that uh, exceed and go beyond all the rest. We're thankful for the life that we have in Jesus, that we can have. Lord, that we can uh, know you through him, forgiveness of sin, and Lord God, peace with you. We give you praise and thanksgiving. We do confess this morning that we fall short in many ways. We invite you, O oh God, to wash away our sin, even as David uh, did in Psalm 51. We've been studying our Bible study. Father, wash us and make us clean. Uh, we invite you to do that. Father, we pray this morning for those who are sick and hurting. We know there are a number of folks in our, uh, in our congregation and several beyond that are suffering in different ways from different things. We lift them up to you, Father, those going to the doctor this week, those going for surgery or those recovering from it. Lord, we just pray for uh, wisdom and the guidance on behalf of the doctors and, Lord, healing. Uh, even as the doctors themselves say, they, they can't bring healing, uh, they can create situations where maybe it would uh, improve, but Lord, only you can do that. You've made our bodies to do that, so we invite you, Lord, to do that for us. Father, we pray comfort for those that are hurting emotionally, Lord, those that might be battling depression, uh, maybe those that are mourning and grieving the loss of a loved one. Lord, touch their soul right now. I pray that they might feel your presence, that they might feel your peace in the midst of all that they're going through. Father, we pray for our congregation this morning. We thank you for the privilege that you've given to us to be a part of this group. We pray that we would continue to glorify you here, lift high the name of Jesus, and be faithful to do whatever you have called us and are calling us to do. Be with us in our business meeting as we share together tomorrow evening, and Lord, I pray that your will would be done. Father, we, uh, our weekly prayer emphasis, we do pray, Lord, that you would continue to provide for the finances of the congregation and, Lord, for the building loan to be paid off. We thank you. We praise you this morning, God, for what you have done and what you are doing and, Lord, for what you will yet do. 
We also want to pray for our Vacation Bible School upcoming. been reminded of this morning. Uh, Lord, about two months away now. We pray that you would raise up the people to help. We pray that you would raise up uh, all the supplies and materials. And God, raise up the children. We pray that you would prepare their hearts and minds to hear of Jesus. And to respond to him and say yes. Father, prepare, we pray. We pray, Lord, that you might be with um, our community. We thank you, Lord, for the community in which we live. And uh, especially as we watch the news broadcast, sometimes we take for granted uh, where we live. And we pray, oh God, that you would continue to give guidance and direction to our local leaders. We pray that you would help us as uh, churches in this community to do what you have called us to do. And Father, we do pray for our nation. We lift up these United States. Lord, you know the... You know the wounds, you know the struggles, you know the sin, Father, and we pray this morning for you to have mercy as we have sung just a little while ago. Have mercy upon us as individuals, have mercy upon us as a nation, O God. And Lord, I pray that you might help us to seek your face, to turn from our wicked ways, to honor and to glorify you, O God. I pray for revival, I pray for spiritual renewal, Lord, from, from coast to coast, that you would do your thing that Jesus might be known and lifted up. Father, I pray for our nation's leaders that they would seek you, that they would turn to you, they would desire you, the members of the Supreme Court, the individuals in the White House and the cabinet and the staff and the House and the Senate and, Lord, each of them, that uh, if they don't know you, that they would come under knowledge of the truth and be saved. And, Father, if they do, call them to a deeper relationship with yourself. Father, we uh, pray this morning that you would be with Michael Cooley as he ministers even now in Sierra Leone, speaking this morning in a church there. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would anoint and use him. We thank you, Lord, for the work that you're doing in that country and the answer to many prayers. Continue to bless it. We pray for Crystal Gosnell John there in, uh, in Nigeria. Lord, we lift her and her husband up to you, Raphael. Continue to bless their work. Lord, also we pray this morning for Jordani and Haiti and Lord, uh, his orphans and the ministry that he has. Lord, anoint and bless the work in each of these places. Father, um, we pray this morning that as we share and worship together that you would indeed be glorified. We pray, Father, that we might remember that uh, this, this hour, although we are blessed by it, is really not about us. It's about us blessing you, putting a smile on your face and glorifying you. And so, Father, in our spirit, do what needs to be done this morning to make that happen. We yield them to you. We pray, O oh Father, that we might indeed be more like Jesus. Father, anoint our speaker as he will come in just a little while. And Father, give him words to say. And Lord, may our ears be open to hear, to respond to the message that you would share through him. For we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, who taught his people to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are going to take a break this morning from the Apostle Paul. We've been following him along, and um, he had a trial that we uh, witnessed there last week. And he's still in prison, and God willing, next week we'll get him on that boat towards Rome. Uh, but this morning we have a special privilege to be able to hear from Brother J.T. Clark. Uh, Brother J.T., many of you all saw either in person or on live stream from our revival earlier this uh, spring. And uh, after hearing this story, we uh, were moved and said, this is something we've got to share in a morning service. We want to watch the movie that has been made, and, and he'll say a little bit more about that when he comes. And so we're very grateful that he has been willing to come. Uh, we're thankful that his wife, although not able to be with him in the early service, hopes to join us later today. And so uh, we're looking forward to meeting her as well. Uh, Brother J.T. Clark grew up in uh, Warrenton, not too far away from us. Uh, today he lives in Boones Mill, Virginia, um, still not 
not uh, on the other side of the earth, so uh, just a couple hours south of us. We're grateful that he has come to share, and uh, the ministry that he and Terry Lee lead is called My Brother's Crossing. And uh, you'll hear more about that this morning as he shares. And so, Brother JT, invite you to come. May the Holy Spirit be upon you as you share today. Well, good morning to everyone. I'm, I'm glad to be here with you this morning, and uh, it's a privilege, it's always a privilege uh, to get invited to come uh, share a message uh, wherever God might lead, but it's, I count it an extra blessing when we get invited back. And, uh, and so that's what's happened here. It was actually just over two months ago, it was February 23rd of this year when I was here the first time. And it started with, a, it actually started with Diane, I'm not sure where she's sitting. Uh, she came to see the movie down in Luray and she reached out to Matt and Matt reached out to me and then I had an email exchange with this guy named George Bowers that I, uh, we went back and forth about coming here for that revival service and had a wonderful time that night. And then on Wednesday when I woke up, I got a message from a pastor down my way named Marvin Wade and he said, man... George is some guy, isn't he? He's, he's quite a pastor. And I was like, what? And I, I started looking through some Facebook, and I realized Wednesday that George, in fact, was the pastor of the church. I spent the whole evening here and didn't know. Uh, and and, and that's, the, that's the spirit of this man. He's got a servant's heart. He doesn't care to be titled. He cares to serve. And, and as a congregation, I can tell you that that's not always the case in the places we've been. And, and uh, so uh, uh, in honor of, of your pastor, I just want to say thank you for uh, inviting me back. Uh, I counted a privilege, like I said, to, to be here. And all glory goes to God. All glory goes to God. I never thought that I would find myself in such places on Sunday mornings because for 49 years of my life, I had no desire and God got a hold of me. You talk about Paul. I was on uh, Route 220 down in Franklin County when I had my Damascus Road experience. And my life has been wholly and wholly transformed as a result. And so I'm going to share a, a, a story with you. Some of you that were here or have you seen the recording, you're familiar with it already. But I want to challenge you to, to listen to it with a fresh set of spiritual ears and process it with a spiritual mind and receive it with a spiritual heart and see what God would tell you through this story. I want to read two verses before I get into it. And these two verses come right after the Lord's Prayer, which we just prayed. It's in Matthew chapter 6, and it's verses 14 and 15, and it reads as thus. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Most gracious and heavenly Father, I come to you this morning in the name of Jesus to your throne of grace and mercy that, that we might be humbled and receive what you would have for us this morning. You send us out for the one. And Father, we are here this morning just praying that one person that needs to hear this will receive what you have for them, Father. We ask that our minds and hearts be pricked and prepared to hear not a story of JT and the Martin family, but to hear a story of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Hide me in the shadow of the cross. Let them see you. Through me, let them hear of your work through this testimony, Father. I thank you for the obedience of Jesus Christ himself who allowed himself to be crucified on the cross for my sins while I was yet still a sinner. While I was an enemy of you, Father, he went for me. It's personal. And Father, I just ask you to have your way in this service. And it's in your precious and holy son, Jesus Christ, my Savior's name. Amen. So I want to share uh, uh, this story that 
really birthed our ministry. And I'm going to say a lot of nice things about my brother and his wife, Bobby and Pam, but I want to assure you they weren't perfect. After all, they did cheer for the Dallas Cowboys. Now, my brother was raised right. He was raised a, a Redskin or a Washington football team fan. But on June 19, 1976, he married Pam and he converted. That's some kind of love right there. I, I, don't, I don't get it, but uh, that was one of the criteria on my list with my wife, Terry Lee. Are you, you cheer for the right team, don't you? Uh, just kidding. But uh, my, wife, uh, my brother and his wife lived lives of service to other people. They sought to be disciples of Christ. It was evident in the vocations that they chose, and it was evident in the relationships and the way they loved on others. My brother was a fireman in Fairfax County. He was injured on the job, hurt his back. After seven years, he was retired on disability. Through miraculous healings and surgical procedures, he got to a place where, for a time, he and I worked at the hospital together in Warrenton. Uh, he took a job with the Commonwealth of Virginia as a hazmat response officer. That's what took him to Southwest Virginia. At the end of his life, he served as an emergency manager in Pulaski County, and at the very end, he was serving as emergency manager in Floyd County. His wife was no stranger to service either. You see, she was an orthopedic nurse, and she spent her time in the operating rooms helping those who had been injured recover from those injuries. At the end of her life, she had served as a home care and hospice nurse. She would go into the homes of those that were making their transition from this world, and she would provide the clinical care, but more importantly, she provided spiritual care. And she would speak words of life and love and truth into the lives that were making their transition, and she would encourage their families that would be left behind. My brother and his wife also served as missionaries in China. As pastor prayed for those missionaries doing that work, I reflected on what they gave up to live in a village so remote that it didn't even have a written language. I could not fathom anybody walking away from the comforts of this world to go serve in such a way. In August of 2015, my brother and his wife, it was a Friday night, they left the community in Floyd where they lived, and they traveled one county to the east, Henry County, to go to a church service at a biker church. The church is called Trash Ministry, stands for Totally Redeemed Anointed Servants of the Most High. The pastor of that church had trained as a junior pastor under my brother once upon a time. They knew each other well. The same night that they led a group from Floyd County to Henry County to volunteer or to go to a church service, I left Franklin County and I went one county to the south, also to Henry County. I went there to volunteer at a high school football game. I was a member of the chain crew. I was responsible to keep track of downs. That night, my brother and I were two miles apart the whole night. He didn't know I was there and I didn't know he was there. In the second half of the football game I was volunteering at, an ambulance that was parked at the stadium in case somebody got hurt had to leave. A short distance from the stadium, the ambulance developed a mechanical problem. It overheated, it caught fire, and it burned up. From the stadium, we could see the column of smoke rise into the sky. We could hear the oxygen cylinders as they exploded in the heat of the fire. By the time the game ended, I left the stadium, I made a right turn, went to 220, and went back to Boone's Mill. I didn't have any problem. But there was a man attending the same football game I was volunteering at. He was there with his 15-year-old son. And when he left the stadium that night, he turned in a direction where that ambulance had burned. And as he approached the scene, they had extinguished the fire, but the road was still closed while they cleaned up and investigated. And they put this man on a detour to another way home. It just so happens that the road they detoured this man to was the road that my brother was leading that group of motorcycles back to Floyd. And when this man reached the intersection with the road that my brother was on, he made a left turn, accidentally turning left of the double yellow lines. He was in the wrong lane. He was coming head on at my brother. 
The witnesses on the motorcycles behind my brother and his wife said that they tried to avoid each other, that my brother overcorrected on the handlebars of the motorcycle and the motorcycle skidded off in the grass and never hit the truck. But my brother and his wife were thrown to the asphalt in front of the truck and the truck ran them over, crushing and killing them. Word traveled back to that biker church that one of their own was down. And Mike Price, he likes to say, we're not motorcycle enthusiasts, we're bikers. Long hair, tattoo covered, leather vest wearing, Bible carrying, Jesus loving bikers. Word traveled back to the church that one of their own was down. He said, we were charged up with emotion and two dozen of us got on our Harleys and we poured out to the scene of the accident. It was just a mile and a half from the church. They wanted to see how bad it was and who was involved and what could they do. When they arrived, they learned that it was my brother and his wife. And there wasn't anything they could do. They turned their attention on the driver of the truck. The driver in the truck and his son are devastated by what's happened. And there they are standing outside of their truck on a rural stretch of roadway in southwest Virginia, devastated by what's happened. And they look up and see this mass of humanity that's gathered. They have no idea they're from a church. And they just happen to be black. The son's calling out to his dad, Dad. What's about to happen to us? And this group of bikers makes their way down to where this man and his son are at. They encircle him. They reach out and lay hands on him and begin to pray for him, praying that that 15-year-old boy would not be harmed by what he experienced. Think about that for just a minute, what he experienced just moments before. He felt the wheels he saw, he smelled, and there they are praying for him, and they're praying for the driver of the truck, that he would be lifted and protected from his involvement in the accident. One of the EMS workers that was there to take care of my brother and his wife, there wasn't anything they could do for him. He witnessed what's taking place, and he goes up to the pastor of the biker church and puts a finger in his chest and says, I don't want to know the God you serve. And accepts Jesus Christ as a savior in the midst of all that was going on. It is evidence of lives lived well when you're positively impacting others, even through your passing. And I'm here to tell you, my brother and his wife lived well. On Sunday morning, C.J. Martin, the driver of the truck, was in his living room. He was devastated by what had unfolded just hours before. His wife is just begging for him, let's take a walk, let's get some air, let's just go to the mailbox. And he can't muster the energy to even pull himself up out of the chair. And the phone rings. When they answered the telephone, it was my brother's daughter. My brother's daughter was calling to tell this man that she understood it was an accident. And as a family, we were going to move on a path of forgiveness. My brother's daughter was calling to tell this man she'd never met, never laid eyes on, hadn't seen, to say, I love you. I forgive you. And folks, that phone call didn't take place months later, weeks later, within hours of her losing both parents. She's picking up the phone and calling him in that situation. He has since shared with me that receiving that phone call in that moment helped him to get to the next day. Now make no mistake about it, my niece was devastated by the loss of her parents. She lived on the same property as her parents, they in one house and her and her husband and family in another house. When she got the news, she fell out in the yard, was pounding the ground, was physically ill. But in spite of how she was feeling, she made a choice to reach out to this man and say, I forgive you, I love you. On Monday, my mom who lives in Culpeper, she wasn't gonna travel down to Southwest Virginia until Thursday and Friday for the visitation and funeral. So every day I was calling to check on her. The rest of my family lives around her. 
And when I called on Monday, my sister answered the phone and she said, it's not a good day. I said, that's okay. You let her know I called. I'll call again tomorrow. And if she feels like it, she can call me later. About 10 o'clock Monday night, my phone rang. It was my mom. And in a broken, coarse voice, she asked me, did your sister tell you? I said, no, Ma. She just said it wasn't a good day. She said, I got a letter from your brother today. My brother, who was killed in a motorcycle accident Friday night, had handwritten a letter to our mother the morning of the day of the accident, telling her how much he loved her, how good a mom she had been to us six kids, how he had allowed life circumstances to interfere with his visitation of her, and how much he was looking forward to coming up for her birthday in September. All I could utter was, what a treasure. What a treasure. His last thoughts were of you. You know exactly how he felt about you. And I began to reflect the difference in the way my brother lived his life and how I lived my life. You see, you didn't part company with my brother without him letting you know that you mattered to him. That he appreciated you. That he loved you. I was asked to speak on behalf of the family at the funeral. My brother and his wife of 39 years were buried in the same coffin together, casket. I didn't even know you could do that. He was laid on his back and his wife of 39 years was laid on her side with her, his arm wrapped around her and her hands clasped together. It took 10 of us to carry it. At the cemetery, because of my brother's service in the fire department, they buried him with fire department honors. He was escorted by fire trucks, motorcycles. They had the ladder trucks in the cemetery. And one of the final acts before we departed from the cemetery was Floyd County dispatched a final call in his honor. And I'm going to play that for you. If you're not familiar with the tradition... The 911 dispatcher in Floyd County is going to call for my brother's Fairfax County badge number three times. And when he fails to respond to any of those calls, she'll announce his final call. That night, after services concluded at the cemetery, our family retreated back to comfort and console one another. But the men and women at Trash Ministry had other ideas. They went back to the scene of the accident. They wanted to place a couple of roadside markers in remembrance of my brother and his wife. They wanted to pray for our family. But a detail I haven't shared with you to this point, the man driving the truck is also a pastor. In fact, from the front door of his church, you can see the football stadium where we had been that night. You can see the scene of the ambulance fire. In fact, you can see the scene of the accident. You can wrap your arms around this entire thing. And not only did Trash Ministry show up, but his church showed up. Let that image sink in your mind for just a minute. And there they are praying for our family and praying for his church and his family and praying for his ministry and praying for the community and looking for healing, but it didn't end with prayer. You see, Trash Ministry prepared food and gave money to the Martin family to help sustain them in the days and weeks after the accident. Folks, that's love in action. We're called to pray, and prayer is so important to our faith walk. 
Please don't think that I'm diminishing that, but we have to be willing to roll up our sleeves and step into somebody else's situation. And that's what Trash Ministry did. I could end the story right here, turn the service back over to Pastor. Maybe there's something in that for you to think about. But C.J. Martin was charged in the accident. He had to be held accountable for what he did. On Monday, October 26, just over two months after the accident, he was to go to court at 2 p.m. About five days prior to that, I got a stern in me that I needed to be there. I did not want to go. Our family was moving on a path of forgiveness toward Mr. Martin, and I was afraid if I showed up in that courtroom, I wouldn't be able to hold it together. Maybe the judge would make it worse on him. In fact, the morning of his hearing, I left my home in Boone's Mill, and I drove to my job in Roanoke. By 9 o'clock, I was sitting at my desk getting myself ready for the week. When that feeling came over me that was so strong, I had to get in my car and make the hour drive south to the Henry County Courthouse. I was about 45 minutes into that drive, and a message came across my spirit. I need you to pay the fine. Pay the fine. This could be thousands of dollars. My family didn't know where I was going. My wife didn't know where I was going. What do you mean you need me to pay the fine? And the very next message was, you don't worry about a thing. You show up and be ready to pay the fine, and I'll make a way. I told you my brother was a pastor. He had lived out his faith in front of me. My wife had lived out her faith in front of me, but I didn't want any part of it. I got to the courthouse. I was two hours early. I went inside. I grabbed a seat about four rows back from the front, and I was trying to reconcile and process what had happened. And what was I going to do about it? And as I sat there, I thought, okay, we're going to watch this thing play out. Whatever happens, I'm going to go to the clerk and I'll write a check. And I'll use my drive home to figure out how to explain to my wife what I'd done. We'd been married 28 years. I was hoping to get to 29. <laughs> and as I sat there, a third message came. I need you to tell the state trooper who you are and why you're here. There were three state troopers standing in front of the courtroom. There was no activity going on. How in the world would I go tell one of these men what happened? I didn't know which of the three investigated. If I go up there and tell them what's happened, they're going to lock me up. It wasn't my idea to be there, and it certainly wasn't my idea to pay the fine. I finally got the courage, and I went and stood against the wall a few feet away from where these three troopers were talking, and I eavesdropped on their conversation. When I figured out which investigated, I went up to him and I said, Sir, my name is J.T. Clark. I'm the brother and brother-in-law of the two that were killed. I wasn't subpoenaed to be here. I wasn't invited. I don't have a role. But I came to pay the fine. He looked back at me like I was from a different planet. He turned. He picked up his investigation folder. He proceeded to walk me back to where I'd been seated. He sat down next to me and he leaned into me and he said, Now, what did you just say to me? I said, I came to pay the fine. He said, I've been doing this 37 years. I've never heard anything like this in my entire career. And he opened up that folder and proceeded to walk me through his investigation. He showed me his written report. He showed me the accident scene photographs. And he gave me an explanation of everything he found that night. He said, when I presented this evidence to the Commonwealth's attorney, the Commonwealth's attorney was considering vehicular manslaughter charges against Mr. Martin. And I gasped. He said, in every case I've ever been involved with, the family always wants more penalty, not less. He said, I hadn't talked to your family when I presented this evidence to the Commonwealth's attorney. And when he came at me with vehicular manslaughter, he said, something moved in me. Don't miss that point. Something else was working in him. It wasn't something else. It was the same that was working in me. He said, I pushed back against the Commonwealth's attorney, and I told him, not here, not in this case. Instead of being charged of vehicular manslaughter, he was charged of reckless driving. That's a big difference. He said, I've investigated hundreds of these cases, and the family always wants more penalty. And you walk in here, and you're going to pay a man's fine? He said, just a couple years ago, I lost my 24-year-old son to a motor vehicle crash. I'm still struggling to deal with the circumstances of that. And he got up and he walked away from me, shaking his head in disbelief. The judge enters the courtroom and he calls the case. And for the first time, I see who C.J. Martin is. He comes forward with his attorney, the Commonwealth's attorney, and the state trooper, all four of them standing before the judge. 
Before the judge utters the word, the trooper looks over his left shoulder, points a finger in my direction and says, you're a part of this now too, you better come on up here. I was shaking in my shoes. My family doesn't know I'm there. And now I'm standing before the judge. The defense attorney says, your honor, we're prepared to accept a plea deal for improper driving. The judge looks back at him, improper driving. I've got two dead people here. Somebody's going to have to explain something to me. He swears his sin. He asks the trooper to give an account. Of course, the trooper tells him the very same story, shows him the same report, the same photographs that he had shared with me a short time before. He says, Your Honor, there's two more things you need to know. This is J.T. Clark. He's the brother and brother-in-law of the two that were killed. And he intends to pay any fine you impose in this case. When C.J. Martin heard that, he cried out in the courtroom, Oh, my Jesus. And he started bawling. Months later, he would tell me that when he entered the courtroom that day, he saw the trooper sitting talking with me. And when the trooper called for me to come forward, he said, I just knew you were there to be a witness against me. When I heard what you were there to do, he said, I cried out to my Savior. I couldn't contain it. I just stood there and cried. The judge turned his head and looked at me and said, what in the world would you do that for? And I had to say something. Well, Your Honor, our family's moving on a path of forgiveness toward Mr. Martin. And frankly, actions speak louder than words. If my being here paying his fine helps him to accept and receive the forgiveness my family's extending so that he can do what he's called to do, enjoy the rest of his life, enjoy his wife and son, Your Honor, that's what I'm here to do. We love Mr. Martin. Judge reaches over, picks up a piece of paper, he says, a few minutes ago, I'm trying to figure out how I can accept a charge of improper driving, and now I'm writing on this piece of paper that the fine is $5. I think about the second message I got on my drive down there that morning. You don't worry about a thing. You show up and be ready to pay the fine, and I'll make a way. God wasn't asking me to check my bank account. God wasn't asking me to call my wife and see what she thought about it. God was asking me to show up and be ready to do what he had told me to do. With the case adjudicated, I walked over to C.J. Martin and I grabbed him up in a bear hug. And I said, I got you, brother. It's going to be all right. I could go on and on about things that have unfolded since that day, October 26, 2015. Before I turn it back over to Pastor, I want to remind all of us these couple of points. That day in the courtroom, CJ said, won't you come to my church? I haven't been to church in years. And the first church I'm going to go to is pastored by the man that was driving the truck. And his church sits within sight of the scene of the accident. The relationship that has formed between me and CJ, between our families, we were binded into a covenant relationship that day in that courthouse. That courthouse wasn't a courthouse that day, it was a church. My life began to be transformed. On November 15, 2015, I surrendered. Here am I, Lord, send me. And nothing's been the same since. On August 27th of 2017, I was ordained as a minister in the church pastor by the man that ran over my brother. C.J. Martin is our pastor. The ministry office that we operate is located now inside the church building that he pastors, House of Purpose. That's, we're on the second floor of of that church we just opened the office up at the beginning of this year it is evidence of the power of God when we will surrender to what he calls us to do this verse in 14 and 15 isn't a suggestion it's not a recommendation it's a requirement if you want me to forgive you you need to forgive others and when we walk in the fullness of that When we choose forgiveness over bitterness, when we choose forgiveness over hate, God can 
work wonders in our lives. I serve an awesome God, a God that I had no desire to know. This is all my life is about now. And I'm thankful that he kept me for a time such as this. Pastor. JT, thank you for sharing today a very powerful story. We are looking forward this afternoon at 1.30. We're going to gather again to be able to see the uh, true, the movie that was made on these true events um, that will unfold and help us to understand it a little better. Had the privilege after the, the service back in February to visit with JT and just unbelievable the way that God has used this tragedy. Um, to bring about good. I'm reminded of Romans 8, 28, that God is able to work through all things. God does work through, not able, he does work through all things to bring about good for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. Um, this is exhibit A. <laughs> I mean, just outstanding. Um, many of us in this room, I suspect, uh, all of us have been done wrong somewhere along the line. Um, sometimes it might have been accidentally, sometimes it was very intentionally. Um, and maybe, maybe you're struggling with forgiving someone this morning. My hope is that the story JT has shared will motivate each of us to let go of whatever that is. To say, you know what, if God can forgive me for what I've done, then I'm going to pass that on to somebody else. I'm, I'm going to... Um, and so this morning, our, our closing song is about grace. It's about the grace of, we started out singing about grace, and we're going to finish up singing about grace today. But as we sing that song today, if there's something you need to let go of, there's somebody you need to forgive. Maybe there are many somebodies that you need to forgive. I encourage you to do that right here, right now. If it's something you'd like to, to pray about together, I invite you to come. We'll be happy to pray with you here at the front. Um, if, if it's just something you need to do between you and the Lord, you could do that in your seat. That's fine. But you do what God is calling you to do today. Don't put it off. Don't put it off. We may, we may not have this afternoon. And so do it right here, right now. If you've never met Jesus as your Savior, you can't give to somebody else what you don't have. If you've never experienced his forgiveness, then I encourage you to make that decision today. Accept Jesus, be born again, come into the family of God, that you might be able to, to share with others what he shared with you. Come this morning as we stand, as we worship, and as we sing together, grace greater than all our sin.
God. We love you and we thank you this morning for your grace that is greater than all our sin. Thank you, God, for your grace that has shown forgiveness to each of us who have received it. Thank you for your grace that has offered forgiveness to each of us that have thus far rejected it. Thank you for the grace that you provide to share and extend forgiveness with others and that others have extended toward us. Father, I pray for the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit to take this grace and share it with someone else. Take your forgiveness and pass it along today. For we ask it in Jesus' name and everyone said. You may be seated for some announcements today. Um, Friend, I want you to know God is real. (laughs) His promises are true. Um, When he says that uh, you obey me and, and you honor me and you do what I've asked you to do, he's able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all we can ask or imagine. Um, if Forgiveness is a choice. It's uh, not something, well, I feel like doing. Um, we never feel like forgiving somebody. Um, but it's a choice that we make. And, um, and so I encourage you today to make that choice. If you're struggling with something, you want to talk about that, see Pastor Dale, myself, any of our deacons. Brother JT is going to be here after the service. If you'd like to talk with him personally, he'd be available and open to that. Um, we will be having our Sunday school hour uh, immediately after this, several different classes that are offered, and so I invite you to attend and participate in those. I want to share with you some other ways that God's been at work this week, uh, more reasons to give praise and thanks to God. Um, Sister Anita Scruggs had her surgery on Tuesday. Um, It went better than expected, and everybody said, (laughs) amen. Continue to pray for her as she recovers from that. Uh, She's in Ohio visiting her son this morning, and will be traveling back, and so uh, continue to lift her up. Remember, um, praise God, that Brother Kent Jeter got along good with his eye surgery on Tuesday, and so thank you for your prayers for him. We're grateful that Homer and Gene Kaufman's son-in-law is out of the hospital. He is improving. Craig Smith, continue to lift him up. We're thankful that Dale Bennett's sister, Joanna Iman, got along good with her surgery this week. That Brother Fred Malk uh, had carpal tunnel surgery, also went well. And a special praise that came in. We shared with you about Michelle Johnson's dad that was going to be having a biopsy on Monday. He got the results back uh, towards the end of the week. And uh, yes, there is some cancer in his lungs. Uh, But no, it is very slow growing, and they're not even going to do anything. They're going to keep watching it. Um, They may not ever have to do anything, Uh, and everybody said, (laughs) amen. Continue to praise God for all that he is doing. Continue to lift um, each of these up. Also, I want to invite you to remember Brother Stevie Helsley. Uh, Stevie had some doctor's appointments this week, got some more coming up, so continue to pray for him as they make preparations to uh, repair a hernia. Remember uh, Sister Donna Babcock in your prayers and continue to pray for her. Uh, Remember Bobby Bowers. Bobby has surgery tomorrow, postponed. He had COVID, tested positive last time he was going to have it a couple of months ago. Uh, That will be held tomorrow. Remember Rhonda Shelton. Rhonda fell and injured her hip and her shoulder. Remember Brother Norm Kerber. Uh, Norm needs a biopsy of some of his lymph nodes and pray that that will come back clear. Please lift him up. Remember the Mary Mumal family, uh, who was a cousin to some of the folks here in this congregation. Uh, remember Billy Carter. Uh, Billy has been battling ALS, um, and recently developed some other breathing problems. So please remember Billy. Remember Willie Malk as he recovers from back surgery. Uh, also, Debbie Dellinger I stopped by and delivered some CDs and some bulletins to Miss Debbie. And she asked that we pray for her, uh, her back and, and some issues going on with her stomach. So remember Sister Debbie. Uh, this week, our Teen Challenge uh, lady, remember Lauren and pray for her. Pray also, invite your prayers for me. I'll be flying to Indiana and Michigan um, the end of this week. I'll be back Sunday morning, God willing, uh, but be sharing some information about the Covenant Brethren Church uh, with some churches out there. So pray for traveling mercies. Pray for our nation and its leaders and, um, and lift them up. Want to share a thank you note this morning that the church received uh, from Brother Doug Klein, dear Antioch Church family and deacons. Thank you for the generous gift cards from my brother Mike after his house fire. The gift was truly appreciated, Doug Klein. 
And so uh, thank you. Those are gifts that are possible through your tithes and offerings each week that we're able to send on and pass on to others. We also want to say thanks to the Ketterman family this morning. Beautiful flower arrangement here uh, from the service in memory of Sonny on yesterday. And thank you for sharing that with us. Also remind you that we do have our men's lunch this Wednesday at Ben Franklin at 1130. Uh, we were up to seven this, uh, this past Wednesday. Anybody that's available, just come and enjoy a meal together. Congregational business meeting tomorrow evening at seven. We'll be meeting at pr- uh, 630 for prayer just before that. Congregational business meeting for all members. Also, newsletters for May are out there thanks to uh, Cheryl Jett's work on putting that together. And so be sure to pick one of those up or take a couple and pass them out. They're a great way to share Jesus. It tells you in there about how you can be saved. There's information in there about VBS, as uh, Miss Becky shared with us earlier. Our weekly prayer emphasis, pray for God to provide for our church's finances through the tithing that the building loan would be soon paid off. Remind you to pray for Mike Cooley. Mike is in Sierra Leone even as I speak. He was speaking there this morning. And because of the time difference, has probably already spoken in the church. Uh, but <laughs> he shared uh, with us, there is a woman that had been praying in Sierra Leone for God to make the cocoa industry profitable again. And for God to provide a well in her town. God has done both of those things. Amen. Uh, Praise the Lord. He hears and answers our prayers. So pray for Mike as he continues to work there. He's got about another week. As I shared with you, we do have the movie today at 1.30, and so I hope that you'll come back. Bring your friends. Uh, Brother JT will also be sharing this testimony during our 11 o'clock service. And so if you know somebody that needs to hear that, and bring them back with you. Okay, You can handle it twice in one day. And so I encourage you uh, to do that. It'll bless someone else. Also, uh, it'll be on live stream. It was recorded this morning, and so it's available by by that method as well. Bible study again this Wednesday, 630 on Psalm 51 uh, by live stream as well. Vaccination clinic at our fairgrounds Thursday, um, and uh, high schools are upcoming, and there are some different dates there. We sent out information about how to register, and so if you haven't done that, um, would like to uh, let me know if you don't have the information. Um, We want to say thank you to our musicians today and uh, continue to keep Nancy in your prayer. She's uh, doing better, thankfully, since she's taken some weight off of it with a walker, but continue to pray as she awaits her surgery in in June. And thanks to our tech folks back there and making all that happen in the sound booth. Pray that you'll go and have a blessed day today as you share Jesus with somebody else.